night. Why is the rapture postponed? Rapture postponed? What did we do wrong? Why isn't the rapture happening? So tonight I'll be talking to you. It's also known as the postponement theory. Oh, oh let's, yeah. Let's look at the book. Uh, what, what would be a great place to start? Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Now, for some people who don't know about dispensationalism, we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe yeah. in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people in the right time period. Yeah. Because if you think that all the verses apply to you, and you combine all those verses together, then you're going to come up with major, major wrong doctrine and heresy. Now, as I come to today's teaching, it's going to be intensely interesting. It's also known as the postponement theory, which is going to be covered uh, in dispensationalism. And then next week, Lord willing, maybe I can cover the fun stuff following on that about the kingdom of heaven, the postponement theory about the parables. So we might have a lot more on that one too. More on Matthew's parables. But we'll see. Ooh. Anyways, the postponement theory, for some people who don't know, basically, it is where God promised a kingdom to the Jews. And when he promised this kingdom that would come down for the Jews, a physical national kingdom for Israel that they were waiting for, their kingly Messiah. And then God would have brought it down, but the Jews rejected it. And because they rejected, they rejected their king, their Messiah, God had to postpone the kingdom, and the church age became that parenthesis, so to speak, for 2,000 years. And God knows our calendars are off, so we don't know how long uh, we got left. And then within this per parenthesis, this parenthetical timeline of the church age, God can resume with what he did with the nation of Israel. So in the end times, he's going to return and continue his kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom with the Jews. Okay, let's look at this. Old Testament, we know that this was all Jews. But then, right here, it should be all Jews. This should be Jews. So in other words, we shouldn't have this dividing line. So let me get rid of this line right here. That way it will be even more clear. Okay, without this dividing line, you notice right here what all of this should be then? You should all be Jews right here. Everything here should be Jews. But then church age is inserted right here all of a sudden like a parenthesis. And this has been going on for 2,000 years. So, we, in other words, we should not be here. So if we weren't here, we Gentiles weren't here, San Jose Bible Baptist Church would not have existed. A lot of people would not have existed today as saved Christians. So we were just a blip right here in God's plan. The, the plan was for the nation of Israel. But then we just happened to be inserted. Why? Because the Jews rejected their king. So then God turned to the Gentiles. So this is where we Gentiles come in. So it's the time of the Gentiles. But then the time of the Gentiles will be up. And when God is done with the Gentiles, because they messed up on God, He's going to go back to Jews again. So the reason why God turned from the Jews to the Gentiles is because the Jews messed up. But guess what? The Gentiles are going to mess up, and they've been messing up. If you look at today, Gentiles are the biggest mess up today. You know, mm -hmm. Oh, pandemic, pandemic, we're doing so well. You know? So it's only a matter of time God's going to get angry and just 
give, give up on the Gentiles and turn to Jews again. So Gentiles time is almost up, and he's going to go back to Jews and continue that promise of his kingship. Now, in order to explain everything right here, then, I have to explain, one, then are you, what about Jesus dying on the cross, Pastor? Because we know that Jesus, he died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. He died for the whole world, not just for the nation of Israel. He died for the whole world. So because he died for the whole world, Pastor, are you saying then that uh, it was that we are not in God's plan at all and Jesus didn't die for us? No, Jesus Christ, he died for everybody. However, just like uh, any plan that goes, there's always a backup. And not only that, the Lord knew, so some people don't realize this. What some people don't realize is that in order for God's plan to work, he has to realize that not all, uh, that the people who are part of the, flag, part of the plan might fail. So with, to keep this plan ongoing, he has to have a different people. Uh, have you ever planned out something where you can't just depend upon one person? You have to have multiple people, but then this plan keeps on going and doesn't change. So that's the thing about God, is that he had Jesus Christ die for the whole world to rescue everybody. There is no doubt about that. So he died for everybody. However, the thing is, God's foreknowledge is set differently compared to his original setup with how he planned it along with the Jews. So what God said was basically this. This is the idea of the postponement theory. The postponement theory is if the Jews received Jesus Christ as their king, basically they would not have existed. And then the Jews, they would have been able to go through the tribulation under the Antichrist. They would have been raptured out. And then the millennial kingdom should have happened. So you see all this here? Remember, all of this is a parenthesis. Okay? So in other words, it should not be here, and this should be all this. So that's if the Jews receive their Messiah. That's if the Jews receive their Messiah. But the Jews rejected their Messiah. Why? Because God's foreknowledge, God knew ahead of time, that they would reject his son. So that's the reason why he has no problem with Jesus Christ when he died for the whole world because he knew ahead of time the Gentiles need to partake in this salvation. So his foreknowledge is way ahead. His foreknowledge is way ahead. It's like Judas Iscariot where God knew, uh, God knew that there would be someone in Jesus' disciples who would betray him. But that did not mean that God had to force Judas Iscariot to be the one. He had the choice. He had every choice and every freedom where he did not have to make the bad decision. But God foreknew that he was going to betray and mess up. See, so that's the idea right here, is that God's plan was set up, but he foreknew that the Jews would reject him, which is why he had the Gentiles. Okay, so we understand the postponement theory, and that sounds where you might say it's pretty wild. But actually, if you believe in the postponement theory, it's going to answer billions of questions you have on dispensationalism. It's going to be incredibly eye-opening. So, what I'm going to do is give you passages, and I'm going to introduce this kingdom first. Now, I'm going to give you proof text that there has to be a postponement. That God originally planned the kingdom, but because the Jews rejected it, God had to postpone it. Switch to Gentiles and come back to Jews later. All right, scripture with scripture. Shall we have some fun? Amen. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Now, when we talk about right here the kingdom, right? Notice there is no doubt that the Bible mentions quite often kingdom. That is very important. When God talks about the kingdom, some of you might know about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, but uh, I want you to forget that for now, okay? I want you to forget that for now. I just want you to see kingdom right here. 
Now, whether it says of God or of heaven, the point is, is that God is king and he has a reign. Just think of it simply like that, okay? When you think of it simply like that, then a lot of these is going to make sense. But I will give a little specific about the kingdom right here, concerning about kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is an earthly physical kingdom. It's not dying and going to heaven. It's an earthly physical kingdom where an earthly Messiah, an earthly ruler that the Jews were waiting for. Now there is no doubt about that. When you read throughout the entire Bible of the Jews, and when Jesus was preaching to the Jews, they were expecting an earthly king. Remember when Jesus walked through Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they said they want to make him king. And there were people who were scared about that. So there is no doubt the Jews were looking for an earthly king and kingdom when Jesus preached about the kingdom of heaven. There's absolutely no doubt about that. You can watch my video, Kingdom of Heaven, and versus the kingdom of God, and that will give more explanation on that. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to try to show you postponement theory. So I introduced to you the kingdom. It's an earthly kingdom. The proof is Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So you notice here the kingdom of heaven cannot be the heaven that you die and go to heaven. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And people on earth are going through violence and wars for it. You know what that is? That's an earthly kingdom. There's no doubt God kingdom, God had a reign and an earthly king when you read the Old Testament, right? David and then all the other kings after that. The Jews wanted that kingdom restored, right? There is no doubt about that. If you look at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. It was that earthly kingdom that they wanted restored. That's what it says. So there's no doubt it's an earthly kingdom that their forefathers or their other kings had back then that they were looking for. Look at Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Acts chapter 1. We'll read verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time, look at this, Restore again the kingdom to Israel. See, the Jews, the disciples knew when Jesus preached about the kingdom, that it was that earthly kingdom he was talking about. And they wanted it restored just like the old days. So there was no doubt when Jesus preached about the kingdom, it was an earthly messianic kingdom. Now that we understand that, let's look at some of the basis here. Let's start off with the book of, we'll do Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. Alright, how do we know that there was a kingdom for the Jews that was going to come? It was about to come, but it was postponed for 2,000 years now. The reason why is because, number one, at hand. Notice that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, they preached that the kingdom of heaven was coming right now. It was right at hand, right around the corner. But it's not at hand, it's been 2,000 years. What happened? They were preaching to introduce it to them, but you know what happened, they rejected. <coughs> they rejected Jesus Christ, so they had to switch to Gentile. In Matthew chapter 3, Notice verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at what? Amen. At hand. Alright, go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We'll look at verse 15. Mark chapter 1. We'll read verse 15. Notice Jesus himself even realized that the kingdom that he's bringing to them is right at hand, right around the corner. They have to receive it. Mark 1, 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at what? At 
repent, repent ye, and believe the gospel. So notice that the kingdom was right around the corner. God's kingdom, and the Jews were waiting and anticipating for that. Now, uh, the people who deny premillennial doctrine, dispensational doctrine, They'll argue that Jesus Christ, when he was preaching about the kingdom, that it was a spiritual kingdom. It wasn't an earthly kingdom. But I've shown you from the introduction, and you saw Matthew 11, that it is definitely a physical earthly kingdom. There is no doubt about that. The Jews understood it to be an earthly physical kingdom. Notice that Acts 1, when the disciples asked Jesus about restoring the kingdom, Jesus didn't correct them and say, no, you're wrong, you had a misperception. No, he said that it's not the right timing yet. See, so he acknowledged, he was of the same understanding of them. I know what you're talking about, you're talking about that earthly kingdom. Yeah. Now, we see here that this is an earthly kingdom that they were all waiting for. <clears throat> Realizing that the earthly kingdom was right at hand, right around the corner. Next proof, Daniel 9. Daniel 9. What's the next proof? <clears throat> that the kingdom was about to come for the Jews, but now it's been postponed for 2,000 years. The second one is because of the divisions, the split time that the Lord did. The split sections of Daniel's 70th week. God gave a prophetic timetable that he called 70 weeks. And in these 70 weeks, look how he divided this. Okay? We get Daniel chapter 9. We'll read verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people <coughs> and upon thy holy city. So God told Daniel, your people, your holy city, see Jerusalem, that I'm timing 70 weeks. And one day I'm going to do this. Now, compare that with Romans 11. Compare that with Romans 11. Go to your hand at Romans 11. Look at this now. This is a future time. This is a future prophetic clock. There's no doubt when God completes his 70 week program with Israel, it's not here and it hasn't been completed. It has to finish. Finish right here, the end times, okay? It's future. There's no doubt about that. How do you know that? Romans 11, Paul says that it's not now, it's future. All right? Look at the wording here. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> and then we'll look at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So Paul said, don't be ignorant. It's something you should know. But people are ignorant about this postponement thing, how God switched from Jew to Gentile. And that God would go back to Jew. Oh, you made that up. No, it goes from Jew, switch to Gentile, switch to Jew again. Look at this. Uh, keep reading verse 25. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Look at that. What was originally Jews, they were blind, but God went to Gentile. But us. But they're blinded, Israel is blinded until, see that? So when the Gentiles fulfill their timing, then it goes back to here to again keep reading. Verse 26, and so all Israel, look at this future text, shall be saved. As it is written there, future shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Notice that God is giving to the whole nation of Israel. This is not an individual. You notice it says all Israel. There, there, there. So this is a national forgiveness. This is a national, and this is future taking away their sins. So we see this is very different from our salvation today. You get saved, you get saved right now. It's not like, no, I'll reserve it at the future. 
Why did he reserve this sin forgiveness for future? Because of a clock right here that he reserved. Go, so this national forgiveness of sins, go back to Daniel 9 again. That matches. Go back here. Daniel chapter 9 again. Verse 24. 70 we see he put a clock here. So he has to go by this clock. To determine upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. See that? That's matching with Romans 11. In the future, the Jews are going to get their forgiveness of sins here. So notice, ever since God was speaking to Daniel, that 70 week was, uh, was ticking here. But it's supposed to end here. So something is going on in between here. Now, keep reading. How is it divided? Well, let's go backwards, all right? Let's start from the last the last one. For some of you who don't know, God divided this into split sec uh, sections, which you didn't know. So he had right here seven weeks. Then he had 62 weeks here. And then he had one week here. And that equals, obviously, to 70. See that? Now, he divided it in this pattern. Let's go backwards, okay? Let's start out right here, which is the last week right here, right? The 70, which should be obviously tribulation then, right? At the end, because that's when the last uh, time period of Daniel's 70th week ends, right? So it's logical, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's see if this last week would fit right here at the end, tribulation. Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Why? I don't know if you knew this. This is the only passage that practically all Christian scholars know is referring to the seven-year tribulation. That's why I see one week, seven days equals one week. That's why they say seven years of tribulation. Because one biblical day equals one biblical year. So, this is a given amongst all Christian scholars almost. So because of that, they can all agree right here, Daniel 7, the last week right here, is going to go at the end. Okay? So they all admit that. Because that passage is talking about the seven-year tribulation of that covenant that's going on with the Antichrist. So if this is the end right here, then things, what happened to the 69 here, right? What happened to the 62? What happened to the 7? Look at this. Go backwards. 27 is the last week. Let's go backwards. We're going to go to verse 26. Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, so there's your 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now look at right here. Verse 26. Messiah cut off. That's a great passage you can use to prove to Jews who only have Old Testament, when was Messiah ever cut off? See, that proves Jesus is the Messiah who died on the cross. But see, he was cut off right here, right? This is what, 62 here. The seven is even further behind. Go to verse 25. Know therefore I understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. See, so from the rebuilding of Jerusalem all the way to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. So it's going to go to seven weeks and three score 
and two weeks. There is your seven weeks, and then your 62, right? There it is. And when is that? That's before Jesus died on the cross. So, oh, what, what happened here? You got six, so you got 69 weeks here. Right? When Messiah was cut off. And then you got the one week where? You got your one week right here, which is the last one. And then looky, humpty dory right here. You got a huge gap. 2,000 plus years. Then it's obvious there should be a postponement. There was a time gap. A postponement. See that? God has to postpone right there. So this is proof also of the postponement theory of the kingdom. The kingdom was postponed. Why? Because of Daniel 70 and week. Daniel 70 weeks. There's no doubt about that. Another thing is compare with what uh, Jesus said in Mark 1 and Daniel 9. Look at this, all right? Look at the wording here. Go to Mark 1. Go back to Mark 1. Look what Jesus said. Go back to Mark 1. Now, God made a clock, a timing for the Jews, right? At Daniel 9, 24. He says 70 weeks, right? He gave that time. When God gave that prophecy to Daniel about the Jews' restoration of a nation and their kingdom, go also to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. God described this as in Daniel 12, 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a uh, nation even to that same time. See, the time is coming, this special time where Michael stands up. Look at verse 4, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and sealed the book even to the time of the end. Look at verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. See, God said it's not time yet. It's not time yet. Everything he prophesied to Daniel about the future and their kingdom and the 70 weeks for the Jews to get their national restoration and their forgiveness, he says it's not time yet. Mark 1, why did Jesus say this? Mark chapter 1, verse 15, verse 15. Jesus said, and saying, the time is fulfilled. What time? <laughs> God gave a prophecy to the Jews, a promise of a timing. The time's almost up. Why? They just need that one more thing. But obviously it wasn't fulfilled here because everyone knows this is future tribulation. So see that? There's no doubt there's a postponement, a gap. Time is fulfilled. Jesus, time is fulfilled. Kingdom of heaven, keep reading, kingdom of heaven is ahead. It's right around the corner. But what happened? She was rejected. So you have to go through 2,000 plus years. Amen. How about that? Scripture was scripture. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but go back to the same text, Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Remember what Jesus said? Did you, over, did you forget? Go back to Matthew 11. As you can see, Bible study is very, very boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have the pink cloud smoke that you want and girly boys to wave their hairs at you and shake their bums so that you can be interested. <laughs> so you can see right here that Bible study is just so boring. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. You know, you, that's the problem with churches. You're not attending a Bible believing yeah. church. You're not seeing real Bible believing oh. church and Bible believing church life. You're just attending a show. That's why uh, Bible study is so boring to you. You, you have to make uh, teaching Bible study 15 minutes and the rest of them just talk, 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 talk. Alright, Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> Did you forget verse 12? And from the days of who? John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven. Whoa! We looked at that verse. We read that verse, right? The kingdom of
kingdom of heaven is being preached, but there's an important person. And that's the third proof. The third proof is John the Baptist. That's the reason why we believe in the postponement of the kingdom, is because of John the Baptist. You might say, really? How so? Look at the book of Luke. Go to the book of Luke. Go to the book of Luke. We want you to go to the book of Luke. I want you to look at chapter 3. I want you to look at chapter 3. Now John the Baptist, when he was preaching about the kingdom, that's an earthly kingdom, right? Kingdom at hand. The Bible prophesied, Old Testament prophesied, there has to be a forerunner for the Messiah, which is John the Baptist. And this forerunner for the Messiah, why is he preaching? He's preaching for running that earthly king with an earthly kingdom. That was John the Baptist yeah. preaching. That's good. Now some people might say, well, you preach about suffering Messiah, and they might use John chapter 1. But for crying out loud, if you uh, that's only John chapter 1. You look at the rest of the passages, it was about the kingdom, the kingdom, and then the Messiah is here, so you have to get ready right now. Why is that? They, the Jews, remember that promise? National forgiveness. See that right there? That national forgiveness right there. That's why they had to get the baptism from John. They had to confess their sins. They had to repent because they have to get ready for that kingdom about to come because God prophesied that kingdom is going to come when the Jews turn back to me, when they repent. That's why there is that national forgiveness. All Israel shall be saved. How about that? No wonder because they lost it when they rejected Jesus. How can you get national repentance? National forgiveness of sins. The whole nation didn't do that. They rejected it. Today, the nation of Israel is probably the world's largest, hardest nation to receive their Messiah, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We're going to look at Luke chapter 3. Look at uh, verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. See that? Why? To fulfill scripture, verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He's preparing the way of Jesus, the Messiah, but look at the context. This is future kingdom. Verse 5. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Why? That did not happen today. This is future where the whole earth is going to tremble and shake and change when Jesus Christ comes down and sets up his kingdom. And then all flesh is going to see God. They're going to see God. Because he's going to come down as a king. So see, this is a future prophecy. Now if you doubt it, just go to Isaiah 40 and read that for yourself. I don't have time to go over there. I've got too many other verses to show you tonight. All right? So uh, if you read Isaiah 40, there's no doubt this is a future kingdom that Isaiah was prophesying right here at Luke chapter 3. There's no doubt about that. So that's John the Baptist's role. What happened to their future kingdom? They didn't get that. That was John the Baptist's goal, though, was to open it. What happened? Postponed. See? The Jews rejected it. So it had to be pushed to the future. Look at this. John the Baptist. This is pretty cool. Look at it. Malachi. What did God promise at the end times? Look at Malachi. Look at Malachi. Look what God promised at the end times. He promised that he's going to send them Elijah at the end times. Look at the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. We'll look at verse 5, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. So look at this. God promised that before his coming... 
in the future and sets up this kingdom for the nation of Israel, the second coming, right? That's what we know, future, we know that. Yeah. So that's obvious. He's going to make sure that he sends in Elijah before that time. And Elijah's job is to turn the hearts of the children to the father and the families. Look at Luke 1. Luke 1. John the Baptist was supposed to be Elijah. To fulfill that role. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now see if Joyce Meyer is so smart to teach this kind of stuff. Oh, she's a great Bible teacher. You know. Look at Luke chapter 1. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this, what the Bible says. Look at this. Now, some people might say this. Some people might say, well, John the Baptist is not Elijah because people ask him, are you Elijah? And John the Baptist said, no, I'm not. So, John the Baptist can't be Elijah. Well, <laughs> hey, how do you not know that John the Baptist, that he was mistaken himself? He didn't know. You know why? Because the Bible shows he should have been Elijah. So I guess the Bible trumps what John the Baptist thinks. No, I don't believe you. Well, look at the scriptures, all right? Look at Luke chapter 1. Look what the angel said to Zechariah, all right? Verse 13, Luke 1, 13. The, the birth of John the Baptist is prophesied as such. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Look at verse 17. And he shall go before him in the what? Spirit and power of Elias. How about that? To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Wait, isn't that Malachi 4? Isn't that Malachi 4? The scripture trumps, but I'll give you a better one. All right, go to uh, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. All right, so John the Baptist, here's the idea of why we believe in a postponement. You know why postponement makes sense? Because of John the Baptist. He should have been Elijah, and God should have brought the kingdom. But now he is not Elijah, so because he's not Elijah, Elijah has to come in the future. John the Baptist should have been. See what I said? Should have been. What does that mean? If the Jews accepted him, they could have gotten the kingdom. But because they rejected, he's not Elijah, and it's postponed. Luke, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Verse 10, verse 10. Verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Right? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. Look at that. Jesus says, Elijah, look at this, Elijah will come. So Jesus realizes Elijah will come in the future and restore it. He realizes that, okay? So the black will come in the future. So not here. I'll have to be in the future. Keep reading. Keep reading. Verse 12. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not. Verse 13. See, they knew him not. That's the Jews. They didn't know him to be Elijah. They rejected him. That's why verse 13. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of who? John the Baptist. See, that is proof the Jews didn't accept him, so because they didn't accept it, that's why Elijah has to come in the future, Jesus said. But Jesus said Elijah was already here if they accepted him. All right, uh, look, at the, uh, look at this. The first rejection of the kingdom was proven when we look at the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew uh, no, it's not chapter 22. Uh, let's see right here. So it's, uh, I don't know the passage right now. But anyways, uh, the first rejection uh, of, of, job, of the preaching of the kingdom that the Jews did, for some of you, you can uh, look it up yourself. Uh, Matthew 21, actually. I found it. Okay, Matthew 21. 
Matthew 21. Look at verse 24. Verse 24. This is their first rejection of the kingdom. The first rejection of the kingdom was John the Baptist. Second rejection was Jesus when he preached the kingdom. Because they said crucify him. And then the third will be our fourth point here. Alright, so one by one. Okay. Look at verse 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I am likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, What? Why, Why did ye not then believe him? What was John the Baptist preaching? The kingdom's right here, the kingdom's right here. They rejected it. They rejected it. So there's the first time. So John the Baptist, they rejected. That's proof. Second time, look at the book of uh, John. The second time is the book of John. It's Jesus. Because remember, Jesus preached about the kingdom, right? So we're going to look at John 19. We're going to look at John chapter 19. But I want you to go to Matthew 10 as well. Matthew 10. Matthew 10. People who deny dispensationalism, premillennial teaching, what you're going to find out is this. Go to Matthew 10. No, the kingdom that Jesus preached was spiritual, and then it been, happened to be with us for the past 2,000 years, and the kingdom is here on earth. Yeah, that's why no wonder you had it. Uh, bloody church history, right? Calvinist. Yeah, you Calvinist too. Well, you didn't do a good job with your kingdom of heaven on earth, and you guys believe some kind of spiritual kingdom going on right now? And deny dispensational teaching? Catholics and the Muslims thought the same way too. And that's why they murdered off millions of people. Because they thought, we're building the kingdom. We're building the kingdom. No, we don't believe in that nonsense. We believe that it's been postponed. We believe the kingdom is postponed. We're not building the kingdom on earth right now, God's kingdom. Everything we're doing is spiritual. But uh, the kingdom, uh, what Jesus preached was a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. Well, no. This spiritual kingdom's for everybody, and Jesus was only preaching a spiritual kingdom. No. Then what Jesus preached, I don't get at Matthew 10 then. What, does, what are you going to do with Matthew 10? Matthew 10, look at verse... 5, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. So don't go to the Gentiles. And to any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the what? Lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. How about that? See that right here? So notice that when God's kingdom is right over here around the corner, it's an earthly kingdom, and by the way, it's only for Jews. How does that match with your Calvinist hogwash right here? And, oh, it's a spiritual kingdom, that's where everybody, he never preached about an earthly kingdom and the Jews rejected, so he had to postpone. No, my Bible says differently. So, so Matthew 10 proved that. By the way, this answers your question about healing signs. Why were there healing signs and why are there healing signs no more today? Because it was for the Jews. But because the Jews rejected, that's why the signs faded as they were transitioning to Gentiles. But what proves it is the kingdom. That because of the kingdom, they had the apostles had to have these signs to prove what they preach is true about the kingdom gospel. Read verse eight: Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Right there, it's because of those signs. Why did Jesus do the signs to heal people? You didn't read Matthew 4, did you? I'm not going to read that for time's sake, okay? I'm just going to give you the verse, though, if you don't believe me. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, and then uh, verse, verse 23 through 24. 23 through 24, or just 23 itself. Because of the kingdom being preached, earthly kingdom for Jews, not the gospel of Jesus died and buried and resurrected, no. It's a kingdom that Jesus Christ is setting up on earth, that's why they had these signs and wonders. No wonder we don't have it today. Why? We are faith is in the word of God. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't have to see these healings and all that. But the Bible says, Paul recognized Jews require us. 
Why? This is all Jews. But it's been postponed. Now it has to move to future. Okay. Things are starting to make sense. Now go to John 19. So Jesus preached about the kingdom as well. There's no doubt about that. And the second rejection was undoubtedly Jesus. Why? Because notice what these people said. In John chapter 19, verse... John chapter 19, verse 12. Verse 12. And from... Thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king... They knew Jesus Christ was talking about himself being king. Speaketh against Caesar. Look at verse 14. Pilate said, Behold your king. Do they accept it? Verse 15. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto him, Shall I crucify your what? King. The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. That's proof, right? That's good. Third, third text that showed it. Acts. Go to Acts 3. Acts 3. Well, let's not go there. Let's go to Acts 7. We'll go to Acts 3. Go to Acts 7. Acts 7. I have a lot more proof text. Let's go on quickly right here. All right? I think by this time you should believe it, right? <laughs> Maybe not enough scripture verses to prove it. All right. Look at Acts chapter 7. So the postponement is not a theory. It is a fact. It is a fact in scripture. There is no doubt about that. Look at Acts chapter 7. The third time is Stephen's message. Third time is Stephen's message. Look at uh, what's... So Stephen, notice, he preached against the Jews. You know, you rejected your king, you rejected your Messiah. Uh, and then notice what, at, what happened in verse 54. They didn't accept his message. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So Stephen said, Jesus is standing on the right hand of God. This should have been their chance to accept Jesus. Like, oh, he's standing up. Why? He's about to accept them. But you know what they did? They rejected him. Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They rejected him. Now, for some of you who don't realize, well, I don't think verse 56 when Jesus was standing, he was about to bring in the kingdom. Good. Um, <laughs> all right, Colossians 3, all right? Colossians 3. Keep your hand at Acts 7 so you can compare, all right? Go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. Notice that Jesus Christ you have to understand this. Jesus Christ is not standing at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting. He's sitting. Alright, he's not standing. He's sitting. Then why would he stand? He's, when, you, when people are sitting, alright, that means like they're, they're waiting, right? Jesus was waiting 2,000 years now, right? But when you're standing, what? You're ready to do. Do something. Alright? But uh, let's uh, look at Colossians 3. What does Jesus do? He don't stand on the right hand. He's supposed to sit. So why did he stand then in Acts 7? Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where what? Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He don't stand at the right hand of God. He sits. When he stands, that means he's coming. He's coming now. No, I don't believe it. James, my. James, my. This is proof that at uh, Acts 5, Jesus Christ was about to rapture them up to heaven. Look at James chapter 5. Look at this. Verse 7, James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, at verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Now, isn't that very true? 
Uh, isn't that referring to the future tribulation? We can agree with that, right? There's no doubt about that. Behold, the husbandman waited, which, which is why he's sitting, but anyway, for the precious fruit of the earth and had long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Okay, there's no doubt. This is talking about his future when he's coming, all right? Look at the next verse. Verse 8, Be also patient, establish your hearts for the what? Coming of the Lord draw up nigh. So it, it's come. when he's coming is very soon, what does that mean? He will be standing. Verse 9, Watch not one against another, brethren, lest he be condemned. Behold, the judge standing before the door. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is nigh. The previous verse behind it. Do I have to show you what the door is? I don't have to give you verse. Come on, come on. <laughs> Revelation 4. Door opened up in heaven. Uh, John chapter 10. Jesus Christ is the door letting the sheep inside heaven. See? There's no doubt. He was about to come. He was about to start some sort of rapture or something. See, so then the fourth proof, which I don't have any room now, but the fourth is Stephen. What he said. His statement. Stephen's statement. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That proof right there that Jesus Christ was about to accept that. He was about to start some sort of rapture or something. To begin the end time, the tribulation. But what did they do? They rejected, so Jesus had to sit back down again. Alright, um, there are plenty more verses. So, uh, let's look now at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Acts 3. By now, you should believe in the postponement fact. Not theory. You should believe in the postponement fact. You should be dispensational after this. Now, you notice right here, if you're not dispensational, none of this is going to make sense then. Then why did all those verses talk about John the Baptist, easy like him, and he's, uh, Elijah's going to come in the future, and what in the world? Yeah. Unless you believe in dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. How about that? Alright, let's look at Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. What did Peter say? Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Now remember, he was speaking to Jews, right, Peter? He was preaching to Jews. Wait a minute. National forgiveness, remember? Repent, sin blotted out. But keep reading. When the what? Times of refreshing. Remember, they're waiting for the time is at hand. Shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's pretty obvious. God's going to be present with them. His coming. There is no doubt. See? So Peter's preaching is another reason why we believe in the postponement theory. Why? Because Peter was saying, repent right now. Jesus is going to come. Get ready for that national salvation and prepare yourselves when he comes. I mean, verse 20 is plain. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before the priest unto you. Isn't that plain? He said, God's going to send Jesus. So you've got to repent it right, right now. Because of that time they were waiting. The time of what? The kingdom being restored. Verse 21 is very plain. That's talking about the kingdom. Who the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. See that? There's no doubt about that. Uh, look at uh, verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you in turning away everyone of you from his iniquities. So we see right here that because of Peter's preaching, that they would have had their, uh, if they repented and got right with God, then they would have got the kingdom. That's what would have happened. That's why this thing is a parenthesis. But look at Romans 11. Romans 11 is proof. So the comparison is Peter and Paul's statements. That's why we believe in the postponement theory. We have Peter and Paul's statements. There's no doubt the Jews were about to receive it. That's why Peter said to get ready, all right, to repent. But look at right here at uh, Romans 11. 
Notice what Paul said. Paul pointed out, believe it or not, that if the Jews received the Messiah, then it would have been, there wouldn't have been that church age for Gentiles, and that the end times would have just proceeded. But then he said, because the Jews rejected, that's why the Gentiles got in. And then he said, Gentiles will soon go away, and God will go back to Jews. That is to all the full scope of postponement theory that what you just heard. But let's look at proof after proof. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Look at that. The Jews rejected it. Paul recognized that. Look at uh, verse 11. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall. Look at that. Salvation is come unto the Gentiles. See, that's why the Gentiles got it. Because the Jews rejected. Verse 12. For if the fall of them be the riches of the world. So if the Jews just fell, they rejected. That's why the world, Gentiles, got rich because of that. Look at this. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, look at this, how much more their what? Fullness. See, what if the Jews received it? Then look at verse 15. 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, look at this next part, what shall the receiving of them be? See, if the Jews received it, what would have happened? Light from the dead. What is that? Ezekiel, National Restoration. Look at oh, Ezekiel. Nice. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Light from the dead is referring to that dead nation of Israel receiving life again and being restored and regathered. Look at Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. See, if they received it, they would have gotten it. Look at Ezekiel 37. Look at verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, <clears throat> carried me out of the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. See, they're dead. Verse 3. He said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? What's that referring to? Look at verse uh, 6. Uh, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. See that light from the dead. But that is referring to what? Verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, those bones are the what? Whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Remember the falling away, they're cut off? But look at this, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. See that? National restoration. Life from the dead. That's what it's referring to. Verse 16, he names the tribes. They're going to come back. Verse 19, names the tribes. They're going to come back. Verse 22, split nations rejoin again. The nation of Israel. So if the Jews accepted at Acts 3, they would have got their kingdom. That's what it's that's what it shows. But the Bible says in Ezekiel 37, they're all scattered. So how are you going to gather them? You forgot Acts 2. The Jews, the Bible says, were scattered all around the world, but they came at that day to hear Peter preach about, hey, repent and get right. See, they would have gotten their regathering. That's good right there. Oh, that answers that question, doesn't it? So it answers a whole bunch of questions. So, it answers the question of Acts 2, why God started the preaching with all those scattered Jews around the world coming to the uh, feast wow. at Jerusalem. Why? All right, here's another one, all right? Another question, all right? That's why, Acts 7, if that's Stephen's last chance, why did Acts 8, God turn to the Gentile? Immediately, immediately, yeah. the next chapter. Then God started with the first Gentile at Acts 8, the Ethiopian. Then immediately after that, at Acts 9, God started with Paul, yeah. apostle to Gentiles. Yeah. 
Why did God call him before Stephen? This makes sense. You want something better? Then what about Acts 10, where God said to Peter, who was preaching to Jews, no, we're going to Gentiles. You go to Gentiles. We're going to let them in now. See, there was a change. You want uh, other questions to answer? All right, here's some more questions to answer, okay? This post covenant theory fills up a lot of questions. Why do you think the general epistles, from Hebrews to Revelation, they're mingled with Jewish and Christian doctrine? Because switching from Jew to Gentile and then back to Jew for tribulation. If you believe in post covenant theory, then it makes sense. Here's another one. Why did the apostles talk as if that the end times was about to hit? Mm-hmm. Unless post covenant theory is true. They thought it was about to come. Did, did, why did the apostles, even Paul, think that Jesus, like they were expecting him to come right now? Why? Because that post covenant theory. They were expecting and anticipating it to come any moment. Alright? It's answering so many questions, okay? Here's another one Matthew 24. Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he said, when you see that Antichrist set up, you flee to the mountain. Why would he say that? That never happened to them, unless, what if the Antichrist was set up right there? Here's another one. Why in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said the Antichrist will come in the future, but he is already here. Unless it was postponed. Why? God had his Antichrist set up. The Roman Emperor. That's why your Antichrist is what? He's following a Roman power. Revelation 17. Babylon. The Antichrist receives his power from that dragon. And that dragon is what? City of Seven Hills. What is Rome known as? City of Seven Hills. That's why pagan Rome... God didn't let them be finished. He let it continue through Roman Catholicism. Mm-hmm. That's why he let the conspiracy elites carry on, the Jesuit order carry on, through the Vatican powers. Why? Roman power has to continue to fulfill Scripture. Wow, this makes a lot of sense, and it answers that question, too, about the Antichrist. Postponement theory just answers a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. All right, did you have fun? All right, you should believe the postponement theory of Catholic. Oh, one more proof text. I got one more proof text. Come on, Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19. I got one more proof text. I feel like I'm missing a couple more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the last one. Come on, Pastor. Look at Luke 19. <clears throat> this is not going to make sense then. Look at Luke 19, 12. Look at this now. This is powerful. This proves that the postponement theory. That Jesus Christ was setting up a kingdom, but he had to delay it and come back to do it again. Look at Luke 19. 12. The parable. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman, which is supposed to represent Jesus Christ in the parable, <clears throat> went into a far country to receive for himself the kingdom. See that? He's about, he wanted to come to start a kingdom, but what? And to what? Return. He has to come back to do that kingdom again. Wow. How about that? How about that? Look at verse 15. Future. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom. Now he gets, he comes in the future, receives his kingdom finally, and does his judgment. If you read that, that's all about the judgment. That makes sense. See, he came to get a kingdom, but guess what? They rejected him, so he had to return. All right, postponement theory is truth. That is fact no matter what. There's no way around this. All right, so in totality, let's sum it up with this. The postponement doctrine is this. God prophesied to the Jews, to Daniel, 70 weeks. I have a timeline set up. I'm going to bring the kingdom, national forgiveness to all of Israel, all right? Messiah's going to come down. Yes, he's going to be cut off, and yes, he'll be crucified, but I'll give them another, but I'll keep giving them that chance. Even after Jesus died on the cross, I'm going to give them that kingdom. That's what he said. That's what we saw in Acts, right? So, in Acts, Peter and Stephen, the apostles offered, but they rejected it, and God switched to Gentile at Acts 8. Acts 7 was their last chance. So in John the Baptist, he 
preached about the kingdom coming, and then they rejected. Jesus Christ preached about the kingdom coming, they rejected. The apostles were the last chance. Why? Because Peter said, if you remember, it was to fulfill scripture he died, and you didn't know. So, repent right now. They rejected. Acts 7 was their last chance. They rejected it. God started to go to Gentile at Acts 8, and then he liked it, and then decided at Acts 9 to have Paul ready for the Gentiles. In Acts 10, he told Peter, go to Gentiles this time, all right? Not only to the house of Israel. But God started originally with the house of Israel. And then what happened after that is the Gentiles, that's why they were that blip that came in. But that wasn't originally what it should have been done. It should have been like this. That was the original system. This just came in because they rejected it. So notice that we're inserted right here. That's why there's two comings of Christ. That's why there's a pro prophecy that's fulfilled in the past and has to go to the future. You know why? It's us. We're that parenthesis. We're that in between that block. That the world. That's why we have to believe in dispensationalism. We divide. Stuff did fulfill up the past, but we believe stuff has to be fulfilled in the future. See, so that's why we had to come in between right here. So then, that's why we came in. But Paul mentioned and Peter mentioned that if the Jews accepted it, what would have happened? The Jews would have, basically, if they, after they crucified their Messiah, Acts 2, God would have said, all right, get all the Jews around the world gathered together. And all these Jews scattered around the world came. God gave them a chance to preach the gospel. And the kingdom was about to be fulfilled if the Jews received it. The Jews were receptive. God was mightily using them. And then God would have brought the kingdom. And then God would have said John the Baptist would have been Elijah. And that would have fulfilled the tribulation. I have the Antichrist set up. That's the Roman uh, emperor. My son already died. Fulfilled scripture. All I'm waiting now is for that Jew to receive it. And Acts 7, Jesus stood up and the Jews rejected it. And thus postponed. And there is the doctrine of the postponement. All right, hope well, you enjoyed tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray tonight's teaching has increased our knowledge of the scripture and realized what an amazing book that we have and that dispensationalism is definitely the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.